This is the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network. The following contains mature subject matter, coarse language, intense situations, and is meant for an adult audience. Listener discretion is advised. They are the internal structure, our very foundation. When all else crumbles, they are the last to go. Bleeders Digest, issue number 15, Bones. This story is called Bones, written by Lauren Shand. It was so calming hearing the repetitive pattern of the raindrops dancing on the roof of the cabin. I turned to my left side and grabbed my phone off the nightstand. I could barely make out the numbers on my phone. 6.42, I cried. I instantly put the phone back down and looked away in the opposite direction. I had a hard time making it out of bed. The room was deliciously dark from the thick rain clouds covering the sun. Even the smell of the freshly washed duvet cover was reason enough not to leave my cozy bed. The heater kicked on and made a loud noise. I've heard the noise hundreds of times, but no matter how many times I've heard it, it still makes me jump. I instantly smelled the accumulation of months of dust and dirt being burned by the gas. This always happened after not using it for a long period of time. Ugh, that heater is so old. Probably why this place is still on the market. I felt myself slowly dozing back off to sleep. My eyelids were getting heavy. I knew if I didn't get up at that very moment, I would fall back asleep and waste the day away. I forced myself out of bed. My feet hit the fluffy brown carpet and I could feel the fibers dancing through my toes as I moved my feet back and forth. I put my plaid slippers on and headed to the kitchen to make some coffee. I opened the cabinet, grabbed two mugs, and put them down on the counter. As I started to shut the door, I remembered, shit, Paul isn't even here. He's still at the house working. I put the second cup back and made a small pot to get me through the morning. The delicious smell wafted through the whole cabin. I felt the caffeine kick in, and I was able to start getting some projects done in the cabin that needed to be fixed. I came up here specifically to make some cosmetic repairs in hopes of selling this thing. It's been on the market for at least six months and not a buyer in sight. I changed the drawer handles to look a little more updated. It looked really nice to have them all matching. Next on my list was to prep the bathroom for paint. I carefully placed the electric blue painter's tape along the baseboards in the crown molding. When I went back to the living room, I noticed the rain had stopped. I could see the sun peeking through the clouds and placing spots of sunlight in the front yard. I had brought with me some flowers to plant in both the front and backyard. They really needed some color. I had read in House and Renovations magazine that great curb appeal and adding flowers attracted buyers to properties. Maybe this would be our ticket to getting this place sold, finally. (laughs) There were so many things on my agenda, I didn't even know where to start. I heard my stomach growl and decided lunch should probably be my next task. After I ate lunch, I decided to take a walk in the woods behind the cabin. I strapped on my hiking boots and headed outside. I loved the feeling of the fresh, cold air hitting my face. I could smell the damp scent after the rainfall. It was my most favorite scent by far. I started walking at a steady pace, but taking time to look at all the beautiful tall trees that surrounded me. Seeing the trees reminded me of something I had just read that had fascinated me. The article had revealed that sharks had been around longer than trees. That's so crazy to me. It said sharks had been around for something like 450 million years, whereas the earliest tree was around, I think, 350 million years ago. I mean, how insane is that? I walked deeper and deeper into the woods. I could see ahead that there looked to be a pile of trash or something on the ground. These woods didn't get very many visitors, and, of course, when someone decides to come visit... They start to leave their junk and pollute our forest. I was so pissed. I started walking faster with curiosity to get a look at this pile of crap that I most likely would end up cleaning. I hated litter and cleaned up at any opportunity I got. I took another step forward followed by a sudden halt. I stood there frozen. I couldn't believe what I was seeing right in front of me. Laid in a sunken ditch was a pile of bones. I felt nauseous. I had never seen bones so large. I didn't know if they were bones of a large animal or human bones. I started to feel sick. As I got closer and closer, the more I thought these must be human bones. It looked like the bones you see on TV, like when you discover a body. 
The sudden fear prompted me to take out my phone and try to Google the difference between human and animal bones. Damn, I had zero cell service. I knew I should have sprung for Teleconnect, but Paul insisted we save money and go with Remy Mobile. I moved around to different spots, holding my phone towards the sky in hopes of getting enough bars to at least call the police. Oh, crap. I only had one bar. I quickly tried to dial and instantly got the failed call message. I tried ten more times until I gave up. I put my phone back in my pocket and went over to the remains to get a closer look. I wish I had paid better attention to Unsolved Mysteries. I looked for any sign of clothing or clues to tell me what kind of bones these were, but I couldn't find anything. I didn't want to move it because I knew enough from watching those crime dramas to never move the body. It also appeared like some of the bones were missing. I can only assume an animal took a few. I really hope this is just a big animal. As I looked up, there was a girl standing 20 feet away from me. She surprised me and had a horrified look on her face. She instantly covered her mouth. She had the same reaction I had after finding out the amount of trash I had come across was actually a pile of bones. I recognized that look of shock and fear. She looked traumatized. She looked at the bones and then looked at me. My mind was racing. Oh my gosh, did she think I was responsible for this? Did I kill this thing? Why hasn't she said anything? Why haven't I said anything? I, sh I should say something before she jumps to any conclusions. I, I was walking in the woods and I came across these bones, but I can't tell if they're human or animal. I I'm Madison, by the way. I tried to call 911, but I have no cell service. Do you have any service? She started walking closer. Her eyes were open wide and you could see how stunned she was. I've never seen a skeleton before. I mean, like a real one. I haven't either. Looks like one of those bones is broken if you look closer. Can you see that crack? Or am I just seeing things? I bent down and looked at the bone she was pointing at. Yeah. You're right. It, it looks broken. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but that does look like a crack. I asked her if she thought the bones might be a bear or a deer, and before I could say... Human. They are definitely, without a question, human. I mean... If she'd never seen bones like this, how did she even know they were human? How do you know they're human for sure? I asked her. I just know. I'm Reese, by the way. I reintroduced myself in case she didn't hear me the first time. Madison. I asked her what she was doing out in the woods, and she told me she was looking for someone. She sounded a bit crazy. I mean, who wanders deep in the woods looking for some random person? Oh, and all of a sudden she's a forensic expert who can identify human remains without question. She pulled out her phone and started walking around the woods looking for service. It's ringing. She must have teleconnect. In what seems like seconds, this place was crawling with cops, photographers, homicide, forensics. Reese answered the majority of questions since she had placed the call to the police. I tried to chime in with any information I had. They sent us home and told us they would contact us if there was any further questioning. I went back to the cabin and told Reese to contact me if she heard anything or wanted to get coffee or something sometime. She said she had to get home to her parents before they started worrying. She lived not too far from the cabin, so I could see why we could meet up for coffee or breakfast at some point. I mean, I guess I was lonely. It was weird because we bonded over someone possibly deceased. When I opened the door, I remembered all the shit I was supposed to get done that I hadn't. I was exhausted. I picked up the cordless phone to call Paul. He would never believe all the crap that just happened. I dialed the number and pressed talk, and there was nothing. No dial tone, just silence. Damn. Paul must have forgotten to pay the bill. I turned the phone off to make sure the line wasn't disconnected and still no dial tone. I grabbed my cell and walked to the top of the mountain, which wasn't too far from my place. Still spotty service, but at least I got a bar and a half. I called Paul. When he answered, he sounded stressed and all out of it. I hope he wasn't drinking again. Hello? Babe, I have the craziest fucking story. So I was walking in the woods. Hello? Uh, anybody? Hello? Ugh, whatever. Shit. He can't hear me. He got frustrated with his poor connection and hung up. I tried calling again and it went straight to voicemail. I tried calling a few more times and always got his voicemail. Oh, damn. I'll, I'll just try to call him tomorrow. I hope he's not shit-faced at some bar. Paul had a drinking problem. And it wasn't bad when we first met. He got drunk occasionally, but as we got deeper into our relationship and eventually got married, it showed itself for what it really was. Full-blown alcohol addiction with a side of drug abuse. Complete with him often beating me for talking out of place. I mean, his father beat him and he beat me. 
I guess it's not his fault. He was brought up that way, but I was tired of it. I was tired of walking on eggshells around him. I was also tired of the bruises. I could never wear shorts in the summer because I always had to hide the marks. That's why we never had kids. I knew he would beat them too. The next morning, I went to town to pick some more flowers for the nursery. The ones I brought home weren't enough. I completely underestimated how big the property was. I tried calling Paul again, and I went straight to voicemail. I was so upset when I went to voicemail again. I wanted him to pay the damn phone bill. I needed to make sure he also paid the electricity and gas bills. Hey, you've reached Paul. I'm away from my phone. Leave a message. I hung up when the voicemail beeped. I tried to call the police to see if they had any information on the bones, but nobody would answer any of my questions. I guess that information would be confidential, but I felt so connected to the case and those bones since I was the one who discovered them. My last stop was Harry's Hardware. I needed to pick up some WD-40 and some paint. I loved going to Harry's. They were a little more pricey than those chain hardware stores, but their selection was way higher end. I also loved that it was family-owned for generations. That's what makes towns like this so special. When I walked in, Mark, the owner, was stocking some tents on a high shelf. He was Harry's great-great-great-grandson. They always had the radio on. I swear they're the only people who still listen to the radio. They always listen to either sports or the news. I heard the announcer say, Radio DJ KWRQ breaking news. Shadow Creek Police confirmed it on Sunday that skeletal remains found by a young lady in White Mountain Forest were in fact human. Homicide detectives blocked off the area after responding. An investigation into the death is now underway with officials working hard to identify the descendant. Anyone with information is urged to call the Shadow Creek Police Department. Oh shit. It wasn't an animal. It was an actual person. I started to feel sick to my stomach. The fact that I was that close to human remains also creeped me out. Was there a murderer in town? Was I next? So many thoughts and feelings ran through my mind that were hard to control. I felt... I felt so bad that someone had died and then I found them. I mean, I was glad they weren't laying alone in a ditch in the cold woods anymore. I hoped whoever this person was that their family might not have closure. That night I had trouble sleeping. I couldn't help but think about the person that had died, and I racked my brain trying to figure out if I had heard or seen anything when I'd been up there in the past and nothing out of the ordinary came to mind. And where the hell was Paul? Why hadn't he even called to check up on me? Why is he such a fucking loser? In the morning, I heard a knock on the door. It was Reese. Oh my god, I was so relieved to see her. I invited her in and asked if she'd heard the news, and she said she did. I said, I can't believe that we discovered someone's body. I mean, what was left of it? She asked me, what do you think happened? I said, I didn't know. I mean, I wish I knew because I can't stop thinking about how that's someone's aunt or uncle or daughter or son. I told her I even tried calling the police this morning to get more information but got nowhere. I asked her if she was okay and she said she was. I wasn't convinced. She seemed jumpy and visibly sad. I completely understood her feelings. We just saw what was left of somebody probably murdered in our woods. She told me her parents were all freaked out about it and they were mad that she went to the woods alone. Whoever was responsible for this death was still out there and it was freaky. I spent the rest of the week working on the cabin. I tried to drown my thoughts and feelings at work. I pulled the carpeting up and discovered some stunning hardwood floors that had been covered up by ugly carpeting. A few spots needed to be refinished, but as a whole it was in great condition. I peeled the wallpaper off the walls and added fresh coats of paint. I tried to stay busy and decided when I got back to the city, I was going to get the courage to file paperwork to divorce Paul. It was something I wanted to do for a long time, but I was just too scared to do it. After finding those remains, I had an epiphany that life was too short and I shouldn't waste my time with someone who wasn't worth my time. I was feeling confident and good. All of a sudden, I heard a knock on the door and it was Reese. She looked nervous and like she had something to tell me. Come in, I said. What's up? Have you seen the news? No. I I haven't turned it on. Did they identify the body? Did they say who did it? Did they find more remains? Reese didn't say anything. She ran over and turned on the television. The flashing of the light irritated my eyes. For as long as I can remember, my eyes have been super sensitive to bright light. Let me find a station that has the news. I went to Channel 11. On the screen was footage of the police combing through the woods. A man in a gray suit said to his co-anchor, And now for some sad news. 
The body of Madison Smith has been found in White Mountain Forest. The body had been there in what has been speculated as six months' time. The body was discovered on a tip from 18-year-old Reese Donaldson, who said she was told the location of the body by, get this, Madison's spirit after playing with an old Ouija board with her friends. The girls have allegedly contacted the spirit and were told by Madison that she was murdered by her husband, Paul, at the location of where he left her body in the woods. Reese is not considered a suspect, and police are on the search for Paul Smith. If you have any information about this case or know the whereabouts of Paul, please contact the Shadow Creek Police Department. You don't hear many stories like that, do you, Jane? You sure don't. Now, for more news on the Shadow Creek Pancake and Baseball Breakfast Fundraiser, B-A-T-T-E-R-U-P. I quickly turned off the TV. It was just too much to process. Did they just say my fucking name? How is this possible? I looked at Reese, who's staring back at me with wide eyes. I was so confused, and I was trying to piece everything together. I couldn't help but be upset. It's true. Every word of it. Don't you remember? So you knew? Why didn't you tell me? I had to hear it from the news reporters and not from you. So Paul killed me? How? Where? I know. I feel horrible and I really should have told you. I just didn't know how. When Sarah, Chloe, and I were playing with the Ouija board, we didn't think we would actually contact someone. To be honest, I thought it was Sarah moving the planchette the whole time. I thought she was just messing with me and made this whole story up just to scare me and lure me into the woods. I thought when I got there, Sarah would be just hiding in the woods behind some rock or something waiting to scare me. I was two steps ahead of her and was ready to scare the crap out of Sarah. When I got there and saw you, I was in shock. You looked just the way you described yourself on the board, down to the same long white dress with flowers on it. What scared me even more is that you had no idea whose body you were standing in front of, or of the memory of our conversation, or the fact that you had died. Madison, what happened to you? How did you die? I don't know. Why couldn't I remember? What was wrong with me? I was having a hard time accepting the fact that the bones we found were my bones. I mean, that's fucked. My eye caught the light from the sun going in from the window. It was being reflected off a copper cup that sat on the top shelf in the corner of the room. It was Paul's prized cup that he inherited from his great-grandpa. He loved that cup so much. All of a sudden, I saw a flash. His cup must have triggered my memories. They came flooding back like a tidal wave. Paul and I were arguing, and I heard him say, Where are you going to go, huh? Nobody's going to take your sorry ass. You're mine, and I fucking own you! I started to head for the door to leave. Paul was drunk as hell. His breath was thick and smelled of whiskey. His face was bright red and sweaty. He was full of rage. Before I knew it, Paul took the copper cup off the top shelf and bashed me over the head with it. He took the handle and smashed it into my forehead. Blood was pouring down my face and dripping down into my mouth. The blood had metallic taste to it. It was so gross that I started spitting it out and trying to get the taste to go away. He had both his large arms wrapped around my chest, pulling me closer to him. I tried to fight back and use the strength of my mouth and bit him on the arm as hard as I could. He let go of me to grab his arm to take a look at the bite mark. I quickly ran and grabbed my keys out of a glass bowl on the coffee table. He was faster than me. He caught up to me and grabbed my leg and pulled. I screamed for help and nobody could hear me. I lost my balance as he pulled one leg and I fell hard. My face was the first thing to make contact. It landed on the wooden door frame. My chin slammed on the hard frame. The weight of the fall caused my bones and my chin to split and break. I heard a horrible crunching noise. The sound echoed in my ears mixed with Paul's anger and screams. I was in so much pain, but all I could think about was getting away. As Paul started dragging me back into the living room, he flipped me on my back. I continued to kick and scream. He reached over and grabbed the hammer that was on the side table and whacked my leg. I screamed in pain and desperation. I felt the bones splitting and could feel fragments moving around in my pants. I knew my leg was broken, and he was making it harder and harder for me to fight back. You asshole! I yelled. He barked back. Ah, you ungrateful bitch! 
He got up and left the room. I tried to move my body, but everything was moving in slow motion. Any weight I put on it felt like too much to handle. I just laid there unable to move, unmotivated as I knew. I was the prey and he was the predator. He was the lion and I was a zebra. I took a deep breath and wished for a quick death as I heard his footsteps coming back. He bent down and gently kissed my forehead. He touched the side of my face with his hand lovingly. He whispered, Sleep well, my whore. With a knife in his arms, he stabbed me in the abdomen. He pulled the blade out and slowly thrust it into my chest and leg. I could feel the tissue and vessels breaking. Blood started leaking from my nose and I noticed how warm it was. I was shaking and I felt a wave of coldness rush through my body. The room got really bright, just a full shade of white. As my eyes moved away from the light and those memories, I noticed I was back at home. Not the cabin, but our abode in the city. I was in our bedroom and Paul was asleep. What the hell? He kills me and he's able to sleep so peacefully and soundly. I got closer to his face. I noticed how all the drinking and drugs had hardened his once perfect skin. I watched his breathing pattern. Every time he breathed and exhaled air. A flash of him abusing me popped in my mind. This bastard isn't getting away with this. I slowly started blowing air up and down his face. He didn't even flinch. The lights of the TV he had left on lit up the room. I took my hands, and with one large push, the TV fell off the stand and shattered on the ground. Paul was woken up alarmed by the sound of the TV. He said, oh, What in the hell? As he pulls the covers up and gets out of bed, I stood right in front of him. He looked at me. We were inches apart. He looked startled and terrified. <gasps> How? This, this must be a nightmare. I left you for dead. This, this is impossible. You're the nightmare and I'm going to gut you. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen Paul so frightened. His face started to turn a pale white color. He reached over and put his hand on his chest and bent over. He tried to grab me with his other hand, but I was just out of reach. I could tell he was having some shortness of breath. With that and the chest pain... It was apparent he was having a heart attack. Which was kind of strange, since I didn't even think he had a heart. And if he did, he hadn't used it in years. Paul got what he deserved. A long, slow death. I would say his heart attack lasted a good 20 minutes before his face slammed against the ground. It looked really painful and long. I bent down and kissed his forehead. I caressed the side of his face with my hand, gently touching his cheek. I whispered, Sleep in hell, you piece of shit. When I stood up, I was no longer in his bedroom. I was back in the forest where it all began. Reese was there with a tear streaming down her face. She was holding the Ouija board and I knew what had to be done. We sat down on the cold, damp ground and joined hands. Looked into each other's eyes and moved the planchette to say, Goodbye. Bones, written by Lauren Shand, featuring Chrissy Fox as Madison, newscaster Jane, and the radio DJ. Trevor Shand as Paul, Lauren Shand as Reese, Mike Crank as newscaster. Engineered by Tyler Connolly. Production, sound design, and music by Chrissy Fox. Theme music by Tyler Connolly, Chrissy Fox, and Trevor Shand. Bleeders Digest is created and curated by Spider One, Chrissy Fox. Trevor Shand, and Lauren Shand. Subscribe on your favorite podcast provider to never miss an episode. Bleeders Digest is a presentation of the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network.